Welcome to the Family Business Podcast, hosted by George Tucker, the podcast by our people for our people. This is your opportunity to thrive, gain knowledge, and understand the impact on our communities. It's time to engage in dialogues about solutions and remedies for us. Every week, we talk about topics from political and civic issues to legal matters to youth empowerment as we awake our social consciousness. Lean into the conversation because we believe in our significance. So without further ado, get ready for the Family Business Podcast with your host, George Tucker, the podcast where your voice matters. Good evening, everybody. I'm George Tucker, a principal, CEO, founder of Tucker Law Firm here in Hammond, uh, Greensburg, and New Orleans, Louisiana. I've been a practicing attorney, uh, specialized in the areas of personal injury and criminal offense for now uh, 28 years. Uh, in April, in April, it'll be 28 years, um, and I'm from a small town called Greensburg, Louisiana. It's the epicenter of everything right with us and wrong with Louisiana. What I mean by that is uh, you are going to see some of the purest, some of the most honest, some of the hardest working, some of the uh, most positive people trying to figure out and navigate through some of the most unfair, unjust, and for many people that aren't from this area, unbelievable circumstances, many of them closely illegal. But anyway, I digress. Well, you all, uh, this is what I call family business. What I mean by that is when I say family, it starts with Greensburg, St. Lena Parish, Tangible Hill Parish, and the surrounding area. I'm talking Tangible Hill, Livingston, Washington, and East Feliciana. These are parishes I'm very familiar with. Either I lived there, I practiced there, or my family either came from there. So this is, uh, this is what I know. And of course, uh, with, with this thing that I'm going to be speaking on, that, most times it's going to be centered about issues that affect that family. And I don't mean any particular demographic because what affects one, since it's a small area, affects us all just differently. And I want to share a perspective for some that may not actually be able to understand or even fathom the effects of some of the things that we are forced to have to navigate in my hometown and where I live now here in Hammond and the surrounding area. Um, many, and of course, um, I have to go into this. I'm, I'm a 1987 graduate of Greensburg High School. Greensburg High School uh, existed up until uh, the middle of the year in 89 when they consolidated the schools. It went from St. Helena, Greensburg, and Woodland High Schools in St. Helena Parish to one school that we have now that I forgot the new name, but when it was consolidated, it was San Lena Central High School. I think it's not something now about uh, preparatory cat. I don't know what they call it now, but that's where I received my formal education and my true indoctrination in San Lena Parish school system and in the San Lena, San Lena Parish community. Um, and this is just, uh, a forum where I'm going to be bringing people in by way of interview and just discussing uh, politics, uh, economics, um, crime, um, sports, um, church, um, and just family, just community, um, whether it be philanthropy or the lack thereof, uh, whether it be charitable events, uh, whether it be uh, entertainment, you know, so this is this is really just a, an opportunity for me to sit and talk to and talk about this area and hopefully either share some light, 
shed some light or look for some light in some of the things that are happening. I mean, I'm always going to make sure that if there's something of consequence happening in the legal system here or the political arena here, that I'm going to weigh in for whatever that's worth. Uh, and as a former unsuccessful politician, I think I have a, a, a sort of a, a unique perspective because in our area, I'm, for whatever it's worth, the only, well, at the time, I, don't, I haven't kept up with it since, but I'm the only black candidate to ever make a runoff in, a, in an election that wasn't purely local. In 19, I'm sorry, in 2007, I ran against our former governor, Governor John, former Governor John Bell Edwards, for the District 72 state representative seat, um, in which there were my, him, myself, and a couple of other candidates that ran. And as a result, he and I went a runoff that I lost. But I learned a whole lot more about our area and our challenges. And we're talking about District 72, which was a majority minority district. It was actually drawn, designed, and created for there to be an opportunity for there to be a black state representative. Now, that didn't happen. It hadn't happened. And just based on good old local politics, it won't happen. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 um, going to be doing a whole lot of this, you all. I mean, I I think that uh, we're we're long overdue for us to have a place where we. When I say we, I'm talking everybody, because there are so many different demographics in this area of the world that are under or unrepresented. Now, they may have somebody in the seat of representation for the district, but we have to keep in mind that in, in, in politics, politics is based on voters. Politics is based on politicians. A politician isn't a politician if he can't get elected. And he can't get elected if his platform isn't about voters. And if you're not in a voting group, then your issues don't make the platform. And if there is a particular directive or a particular narrative in place to make sure that a certain demographic is plagued by A culture that creates an underrepresentation, meaning if there are 200 of you all and something is in place to make sure that 90 of you all don't even get to vote, then they're not really dealing with 200 of you. They're dealing with 110 of you. And of that 110 of you, they are still in things in place to try to make sure that of that 110, although you're not automatically excluded from those that can vote, there are some things that have made it very cumbersome very intimidating or extremely inconvenient for you to be a voter. So now that 110, you may have 60. So you have 200 citizens that can only be represented by 60 voters or whatever number I came up with out of 200 people. So when somebody's out here with a platform, they're not looking at all the citizens, they're looking at those who affect their ability to be an effective politician, not a leader because that's not what politics is. The political system made it, but it's, it's, it's run by politicians. And in order for the politician to feel like they have actually been able to benefit from being in politics, they have to get reelected. And when they're there the first time, they're just feeling out how this stuff works. What can I get away with? 
Who do I need to make sure that if I step out of bounds, I get away with it? Where are the actual boundaries? I understand what a sideline is, but that may not be the boundary that we're going to be held to. We may be able to actually go all the way to the bleachers. But as far as the public knows, it's a sideline. But in the world of politicians, they get the benefit of, of from the actual sideline all the way to the bleachers. We don't know that. We find out that something doesn't make sense to us, but we don't want to know why. We have no idea why. Only they know that. So that's just politics. Y'all see, I, I, I delve a little deep into that because we have a lot of things that this area, St. Lena, Tangible, Washington, Livingston, East Feliciana. I don't know about West Feliciana. That seems to be a totally different demographic because in that parish, they have uh, some really um, high income jobs. Uh, Tangible Parish, I don't think we have very much industry other than hospital and and um, university and whatever, whoever gets the benefit from that. Then we have St. Leonard Parish where all of our industry, if you just do your homework, all our industry is leased out. We have wonderful natural resources that are being piped out of there because somebody gave them the benefit of not paying taxes. So we don't have a school system. We don't have hospitals. We don't have roads. So we don't have anything to attract young people to bring their kids to go to school. We don't have anything to make people retire there because we don't have a hospital. Anybody gets sick, they get there, get stabilized, get the hell out of there. Then we don't have roads because we still have, there, are, there is not a four lane highway in Greensburg, in St. Lena Parish. We don't have railroad. There's no railroad in St. Lena Parish. So, you know, we have all kinds of resources that somebody, where they set up a couple of plants there that have been tax exempt for 99 years. Then when they go hire people to higher levels, they don't hire anybody locally unless they're, they're tied in to somebody in Livingston Parish. <laughs> so we don't get any, we don't get any benefit. None of the money that's made in the parish stays in the parish by design. Do your homework. And see, that's the kind of things that I'm going to make sure that I don't care what you decide to do with the knowledge. I want to make sure that we talk about it. And if there's somebody that tells you different, let me know. And I just bring them on here and show me what you're telling me. Because we are too trusting our politician. I don't mean trusting because we, we, we don't trust him in private. In private, you say, you know, damn, you know, you don't like him. You don't trust him. You don't believe him. And then when I see you in public with him. I don't see your, I never, I never see your lips. All I see is your teeth <laughs> in public, but in private, you don't like him. So anyway, you all, that's just St. Lena Parish. I'm not talking about tangible because I'm, or East Feliciana or Washington, because I know you all don't do that. You, uh, you all make sure that you all are abreast of and um, aware of. Because abreast doesn't necessarily mean aware. And I think awareness, you know, I, I used to be a wordsmith, but the older I get, the less wordsmith I am. Because I always starts to blunder and bumble. But I'm, on, I'm, I'm only doing this because I really want us to know better so that we can at some point be empowered to do better. You know, because we we in this area seem to, and it depends on which demographic, because when I start talking for St. Lena Parish, I'm just talking for the poor, because in St. Lena Parish, poor doesn't really have a color. It may be, it may have a picture they take to show you a poor, but I know better. The pitch, the poor sitting in the parish is much more represented by all of us than it is by the narrative. So when I'm speaking, I'm speaking on behalf of all of us, all of us that grew up in that demographic that didn't know uh, there was a better way of life other than what we saw on TV, but we didn't have cable other than if you lived in town. So, um, 
I have a very uh, intimate connection to poverty. I have a very intimate connection to disenfranchisement. I have a very intimate relationship with Injustice. I have a very intimate relationship with racism. And I also have a very intimate relationship with true friendship that crosses racial lines. And it all seems to be oftentimes based on uh, ignorance. I'm talking about the fault lines, the fractions, the, the separations, oftentimes based on ignorance, intentional ignorance. So this is what this is going to be. Now, I, I know that there may be some people that uh, don't have a use for this, but I think that what I'm saying will, um, and what I'm going to be presenting on my platform, family business, when I say family, I mean the family of these parishes. I'm talking San Helena, Washington, Livingston, Tangipahoa, East Feliciana. Because one, and the reason I stopped there is because once you get outside of there, things are a little more urban. And these things may not resonate as well with them unless they came from there and moved to these more progressive places. And when I say progressive, I just mean as in the label, not as in the real life. Because I went to college in East Baton Rouge Parish. I saw a whole lot of the same mentality it just had a suit on. In Greensburg, it had on overalls. But in Baton Rouge, they have on a suit. But still the same dance. They're both shuffling. You know, rather than say, Yaza from Greensburg, they say, yes, sir, in Baton Rouge, but it's, it's still shuffling. <laughs> it just looks different. And if you don't know how each looks, you may mistake either for something that's not really different. It just has a few distinctions, but no real differences. When it's all said and done, it's small distinctions, but no real differences. I've been, a I've been there to be blessed to see it from both sides. So, and then once again, I'm not talking about color now, I'm talking about character. Shuffler is a shuffler. Whether it's because his family is trying, to, he's he he's trying to get the benefit of being assimilated and associated with a more popular, more respected family. Then there's of us from another race who just wants to be associated with a preferred race. So, you know, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm speaking to all of us, and. I've once again, I've just I've determined that somebody needs to speak to everybody, not speak for everybody, but speak to everybody because some of these things that people on the left may think are peculiar to them is only because they haven't seen that over here is not different. It just has some distinctions. So I'm hoping that in that I've had a chance to visit the right after having been socialized to the left, that my perspective will be from the middle, but it'll all be based on facts. I'm going to bring us some facts to help us understand how some of us got to the right and why some of us are sitting over on the left wondering why we hadn't gotten closer to the middle. 
not understanding that a lot of stuff on the left was never meant for you to get to the middle. It was just for you to get somewhere where you were comfortable and then now they don't have to address any unrest because you're comfortable. Because you bought into a narrative that's just that, a narrative. And you were sold it by a culture that's being paid for you to buy the narrative. And that's not me pontificating. That's not me um, assuming. Once again, like I told you, I ran for state office. And I went through the traditional means. I'm sorry, the, the traditional avenues that you're supposed to be able to go and trust that this group of people are here for the good of the people that believe in them. And I also had some very rude awakenings and very, some very uh, sad realities that I had to face. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to get into all of those. That's not what this is about, to actually go into the details of that. But that helps to help us segue into the economics of living in this demographic, living in this geographic location. Forget the demographic because, once again, the demographic here is at one time we had three classes, a three-class system in our parishes. That's rapidly deteriorating into two classes, the haves. It's not even classes, groups, the haves and the have-nots. The middle class was the maybe have-not, but play your cards right, you will have enough. That's eroding. It's eroding on one end and being erased on the other. It's eroding to the left, but it's being erased from the right. Because if you can erase the middle class and keep erasing that, you, you keep moving more of the upper class to take up more of this little graph that I have here in my mind, this mental picture or this line where you have the lower class the middle class, upper class. They're about, and the middle class is supposedly to be the, the largest. Well, and then we're talking about right and left. We're talking the liberals being the far left, and they're talking about the conservative being the far right. We're talking about the rich being the far right, and the poor and sympathizers being to the left. Because some of the rich, are sympathizers left in their ideals, but right in their realities, in, in their abilities to afford. Their affordables are right, but their ideals may more align with assisting of some philanthropic involvement in the left, okay? That's enough of that. But then they have those in the middle that foot the bill for everything on the right and everything on the left. The whole tax system is built on the middle. The poor can't pay, the rich won't pay. So the middle class pays for everything. Well, what's happening is the right is erasing the middle class and their politics is eroding the middle class for those coming from the left. So what's gonna happen is the left is coming a whole lot bigger, which is the poor, just the lower class. And what that's gonna be is the have nots and the haves. And those that rebel against this will be those that'll be detained in these um, these camps that you're seeing popping up. If you don't believe them, take a look. Go and Google, um, what do they call it? The um, Homeland Security. Google those Homeland Security uh, camps that they're being, being, you wonder why all of these uh, immigrants are coming in. They have no connection to any of the politics, so whoever's in power will dictate how they move. They're only gonna, they're only gonna move based on who's in power. So there's a push from the right to make sure that, that all these people don't get all this grace in these sanctuary cities while they're being let in by the people from the left. But the people from the right if they keep eroding the middle class, when they finally get here, they're going to 
take these people and just make them all military. Now, a, a police officer, they're gonna put them in some position of authority and they're gonna become mercenaries. They're gonna only care about what is now allowing them to have more privileges while they're trying to earn their rights. And that's just my belief. That's what I, that's the economics of this deal. You know, um, you're seeing all of these big stores close and not, not understanding that if we as a, that come from a poor background, I'm not, when I say we, I'm talking about those, not, not, not who I am now, but, but I'm sorry, not where I sit financially now, but uh, those who have to start from not having need to pay attention to the new avenues that are opening up because the way that they're doing when they decentralize and, and get rid of all of this, the, the, the way we see money now, it's going to be a global rich, global poor. Going to package all of those poor together and make them subservient. Or become genocide casualties. That's what it's going to come to. Those that understand that they're meant to serve, I mean, it won't be slavery, but it'll be the closest facsimile thereof since slavery. And if you don't believe it, Google Syria and slavery. They're enslaving Africans in slavery. See, this is my platform, and I'm just trying to get people to open up to uh, the fact that we're sitting here having to choose between a president that we have now and who I really think is going to be um, Donald Trump as a Republican candidate. And this place is, is, is so unstable that you're going to be forced to choose now between uh, a man whose policies were to dehumanize blacks. And, and I'm talking about Biden. I, don't, I mean, I'm not talking about something I believe. It's not what I'm feeling. I'm just saying this is what it is. Um, and Donald Trump, we got the one who, who dehumanizes blacks. We have another one who empowers those who never saw him as human anyway. So we better get buckle up and get ready for a ride. And that's okay, you know, if you understand what it is, prepare yourself for what it's going to be. Because both are starting to look really bad. And the only way to resolve a lot of this, whether it's in our favor or not, I'm not talking about just any particular group, I'm talking about as Americans, is they're going to try to resolve it by somebody going to war. And then that will be explaining why they have to do so many safety measures and everything is going to be you have no more rights to privacy because they're going to say not all these people here, anybody can be a terrorist. So there's a whole lot of stuff happening here that is going to change the way we see our lives forever. They're letting a lot of people in to then turn around and say that you don't have any rights because they got terrorists. And then you'll be okay with it because you're afraid that that's what's necessary until you become a victim of your own compliance, your own acquiescence. We're going to vote to be in a military, I mean, in a police state to then now have them police those that they subjectively feel need to be policed. And that'll be based on, now it'll be based on, because see, they're letting a whole lot of Africans in now. A whole lot of Africans are coming. So when black, you could be one of those. So now, when, when they start having some terrorist attacks, now they're going to say it's because of some of these 
people that let in, and now you look like a terrorist. There goes some more of your rights, rights of privacy, going into all of your, your, your business affairs, everything. Because you may be supporting them, but they let them over here because they needed to create the, another face of terrorism. Because right now, we're not the face of terrorism. Not Africa, not, not the blacks here in the U.S. So they need to have them be the face of crime. And now when they get all of these non-citizen blacks over here become the face of terrorism, to go with the face they already have, so every face that ain't white could be a terrorist. Or you could be helping them. So they bust you down to nothing. If you don't want to comply, that's what the camps are for. You do comply, you're broke, busted, you have all these skills, now use them to make life better for them. When I say them, whatever, whoever's in this class over here in the halves, because that's not going to be all white, it's not going to be all anything, because there are going to be so many people from all ethnicities ethnicities that will just identify with having and those that don't have they don't identify with they'll make sure you have the understanding of that's what way this is going to work or you're going to get ostracized get your ass out <laughs> that's going to be mm, I say we got about 20 years left before it gets that so if if you want to have an option to determine whether you can either turn your back on the have nots make sure you're not one of the have nots Oh, you don't have an option. That's what it's going to boil down to in the next 20 to 25 years. The haves and the have-nots. Then you're going to determine whether you're going to be a help or a help-not. But if you help too much, then you're going to be over here with the have-nots. And the haves are going to take your stuff. Yeah, so that's... Uh, family business. That's where we're going with this. It's going to be my appreciation based on my education, my indoctrination, my um, experiences, my exposures, my relationships, my communications with people. Yeah. And my personal experiences with politics. Um, because at, at the root of most of what we're, we're trying to do and how long it takes us to get it done what we want to do and how long we stay committed to it and what we actually get done most of us committed I'm sorry most of it's determined either directly or indirectly by the political climate who allies with who and what and when and how those people and things they align with are postured. Are they in a position of superiority, majority, inferiority, minority? I'm not talking as in race. I'm talking as in the power structure within politics. Whether we're talking local, whether we're talking Regional, we're talking statewide, or we're talking nationwide. We have a new governor who right away is making it easier to go to prison and harder to get out. He's going to be a blessing to the peonage policy and the slave labor culture for inmates, which directly benefits the haves because if you don't understand what work work release is and who do you think they're working for? This is once again the way to gain wealth and not have to share it. You hire inmates to work for pennies on the dollar. It's the closest thing to slavery where you get free labor. State the state pays for you to get people to work for free because the 13th Amendment said you can't get them to work for free as a citizen. The only thing that's illegal, according to the Constitution, 
is to privately own slaves. But the state can own them in the way of inmates and lease them to you. And you just make sure you support the people in power so that you can continue. And then they create a way for you to now privately own slaves with private owned prisons. And even in those, they lease them out. And they get so excited to be able to go outside and work for pennies on a dollar that they'll do anything to comply so that they can go and work in these industries. Yeah. I'm just touching a few things, you know, uh, so that we can all understand where I'm going, where I'm coming from, and how I got there. And how so many of us uh, are seeing things that we understand and we understand so clearly that we want to believe that we don't understand because it can't be what it is. But it is. So once we actually can go on and embrace it, we can address it. But until we embrace what is for what it is, we'll continue to try to find a way to live as if it's not. And even when it comes home to roost, it's a lot more palatable for us to just say, no, this can't be what it is. Because once we have to accept that that's what it is, we have to ask ourselves now, what is it that we're called to do about it? And if the answer is nothing, how does that feel when you look in the mirror to know that you know, know that you need to do, and know that you didn't? Mm -hmm. See, those that don't know, don't do. But it's a whole different thing when those of us that do know choose not to do. You see, and I'm I'm going to uh, start to taper this, but I'm I'm I love this space because it's mine. It's my space. <laughs> you see, um, with this thing they keep talking about the civil rights era and all of this and that and the other and when it ended and all that, they make us believe. No, we choose to believe. And this is Black History Month, so. Um, it's just amazing that Black History Month is always riddled with politicians and the only true activists that we talk about during this period all died in 68 or 69. Nobody else. We don't talk about anybody else as an activist. And everything that we... Everything that we are fighting over, or gloating over, will reach its peak in 68 or 69. There's nothing else that's happened. But every year for Black History Month, we have kids reciting I Have a Dream and dressing up as Harriet, what the, Harriet Tubman and we don't have anything else that we do past 69. Unless somebody else has something they can tell me. Because I used to be, I have a dream. That was mine. And, you know, Mega Evers and the little boy that they crushed his head. Uh, the little kid from Chicago that was down in Mississippi put this, uh, Emmett Till. It's like, what do we, What else do we have to talk We take a whole month to relive all of that. That's what we do. Black History Month. Teachers are still having kids 
do. I have a dream. And I may enrage some people with my disdain for that being where everything ends and a disdain for the fact that we put so much weight on that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There, There is one other thing. They're going to be Barack Obama and Michelle. Those are the things that we have to talk about for Black History Month. Barack Obama, Martin Luther King, and Barack Obama. No Jesse Jackson. No Muhammad Ali. No Sidney Poitier. No Jim Brown. Yeah. I'm not talking about for sports. Nobody wants you to keep up with Muhammad Ali's real story. Because it's too easy for us to believe that we as an individual can make a difference just based on how we choose to live. It, it, it may be a little bit much for people to accept that somebody can actually choose their culture over their career. That may be frightening because everybody can do that. Not everybody can get them to speak to 100,000, but everybody can choose their convictions over their career. We can all choose our convictions over our career. We can all choose our career based on our convictions. That's individual. But we spend all of our time in black history focusing on what one out of them, 20 million us can do or can even fathom having been done rather than focusing on what each of us can do. It's just choosing convictions over careers or choosing careers based on convictions. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm not the best Bible scholar, but I mean, I, I think I've heard something about how your gift will make room for you. Well, that's true. Just even if you don't believe in God, just believe in the universe. That no matter what it is, wherever you find your focus, you find your future. Whatever your focus is, that's your future. But if enough of you focus on the same thing, that is the future. Enough people with the same focus can dictate a future for a whole community. But you can always dictate your future. Because your focus is your future. So a lot more of us need to try to find out how to make our convictions our career or when it boils down to it, make our convictions bigger than our career if they weren't the same to begin with. Because at some point, they won't just not align, they will conflict. You're going to have to make a decision. Oftentimes, we've already made it that we've been conditioned and educated to believe that our career is the most important thing in our lives. Until we have to give up everything for our career and they take that from you anyway. Now you're left with nothing because you've been publicly stripped. You've, 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 you've publicly shown that your career means more than convictions. Then they'll take your career. When I say they, I mean those that dictate how far you go in your career. How much of your career you have access to the things that make your career rewarding. You're divorced from all the things that really matter to you because you've been conditioned to believe that your career matters most so long that you've lost connection with your convictions or connection to those that actually are here 
to support you because they have the same cares that you have the charisma to turn your convictions into actual change. And I won't say you're for sale. But what are you? That's what I'm going to be doing, you all. I look forward to actually opening up my platform because I'm going to be reaching out to people just based on whatever it is I feel like talking about that week because this is going to be a weekly deal. Um, I'm going to be speaking. If it's near election time, you better believe it's going to be politician heavy. If there is uh, something that happens in the community, it's going to be about those things and those people or that community that was affected. I want to understand it because some things just don't make sense. But they could. It's just somebody has to make it make sense. Then there's going to be sports, y'all, because it seems that the thing that we excuse me, are quickest to address in this area is sports, whether it be East Street of Shiana with a guy from way back in my era named Shank, who's Glenn Sanders and um, there was a the Bradford kid thereafter, you know, people that go to the NFL from these different areas. I don't really know many basketball players from St. Lena, Tangible, Livingston, or Washington that went to the pros in basketball. But, you know, we started talking about St. Lena Parish and pro football. We have our share of those. Tangible Parish is rich in pro football players and college stars. And Washington Parish is rich in them. Livingston Parish has its share of those who had at least, you know, memorable college careers. So we're going to talk about sports, but I don't I don't have a whole lot of time or energy to devote to sports other than supporting these kids as athletes and making sure that they don't become their own fans because those that don't understand what's ahead of them will have already had enough impact on what they're willing to do because they don't think they have to. That's going to be a very small part of what we deal with. And I want to be able to show how all of that stuff ties into creating a, a person who's accountable because that's what our area needs. We don't need a whole bunch of pro athletes. We need a whole bunch of men who are accountable and women. So I just, that's my appreciation for sports. Accountability, not just responsibility. Everybody gets responsibilities attributed to them, but we don't actually benefit as a community until that person accepts accountability. One of the quickest ways to deal with accountability is in sports because if one messes up and you allow it, we have a quick understanding that we're all going to pay. And if you decide not to, then those are the ones that end up quitting. But those that understand how what they do affects the group, either benefits or costs them, understand what their contribution or lack thereof does to a community, does to a culture, does to a country. That's it for sports. Not going to be on here doing a whole lot of that. We all have our talents. We all have our attributes. We all have our stories. We all have people who won because of something they didn't have to contribute to. They just had to get a uniform. A lot like we see in the community. People just based on what they're a part of get the benefit. Then there are others who don't get the benefit based on what they're a part of, no matter what they contribute. Anyway, that's it for sports. Economics, that's easy. You know, the money follows the light. So either you're going to bring light and attract money, or you're going to be one of those who chases money by following the light. Or you're just going to be the light and create that anyway. That's about my take on economics. But what it's all said and done, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the people. What we can do. What we do. Why we do. And more importantly, why we don't. Because a lot of what we don't do is based on us not believing that it'll make a difference. And that's why I'm talking more about individuals like Muhammad Ali and conviction over careers. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, when I'm growing up, there are people like, um, 
from way back when I was a boy, Mr. Frank Martin, uh, Ray Porter, uh, Mr. Obi Hook being up in Kentwood. Um, I'm not too, too sure who was over the little group and they meet. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing about different people on the South end now that I'm here and when I get involved in politics, you know, you start seeing certain names that people, um, have attached to as being leaders from the past. But when I talk about these people, we're talking about people who just did what they could and it made a difference. I'm talking about just now, you don't have any more of these people who will go, everything's corporate now. But when I was growing up, the people that I'm mentioning, I mean, maybe, maybe Mr. Frank Martin did, but Ray Porter never finished high school, but had a huge impact on my life and and helped me to understand what being a man was. Um, but they made sacrifice. They go to work every day, leave work, and come out here and coach baseball out of their pocket. I don't know who bought these baseball bats. Maybe it's his boss bought them. I don't know how he got them. I don't know how he bought these gloves. I don't know how he bought the sack. I don't know how he bought the gas. I don't know what made him be able to take everybody home after practice. But once again, we're talking about convictions over careers. I mean, if somebody who sees where they went wrong in life want to make sure that they lay a better path for those who look like they may be headed down the same path unless somebody helps them, they did rather than talking about what somebody needed to do. That's what a lot of this is going to be about. Be the person that you say the community needs. Because if it's something you think they need, it's probably something you will be convicted enough to do. So let's quit talking and start doing. So when I'm talking about family, that's what I'm talking about. And that's what we're here to discuss because we're all the same rural, underserved, underrepresented, underacknowledged, underpaid, and statistically undereducated that's us. So whatever problem we have, we're going to have to solve them. But the first thing we have to do is acknowledge them and acknowledge that the problem is ours, not that group's, not this group's. Because we all, if we don't do that, we all living in a false reality. And even when we see the truth, we don't want to acknowledge the fact that we are part of the reason that it's the truth. So I'm going to be bringing people on and we're just going to have people to help us understand because there'll be some things that I may have been able to be uh, privy to that I don't understand. So I get people to help me understand and you understand at the same time. So I look forward to it. Um, tune in. It's going to be at the very least entertaining. The plan is for it to be informing and the goal is for it to be empowering. Good evening. Thanks for tuning into the Family Business Podcast with host George Tucker, the podcast by our people for our people. Join us every week for your opportunity to thrive, gain knowledge, and awake your social consciousness. It's our goal to bring solutions and remedies for us. Every week, we talk about topics from political and civic issues to legal matters to youth empowerment as we find ways to galvanize our communities. So until next time, Understand your voice matters and it deserves to be heard. God bless from the Family Business Podcast and host, George Tucker.